A very good morning from Stanford University. Uh, my name is Will Chu. I'm the faculty co-director of Storage X Initiative here at Stanford. And I'm delighted to be joined um, by Professor Itui, the director of the Precourt Institute for Energy, to host today's uh, Storage X uh, seminar. So we have a very interesting topic today uh, related to battery technology. So um, batteries really span all the way from atoms to systems. And today we are really delighted to talk about that larger link scale uh, of battery technology. If we think about how to innovate batteries, we can innovate them at the chemistry level, but we can also innovate them at the cell level. And finally, we can also innovate them at the pack level. And today we are really delighted um, to have two pioneers in this area uh, to talk about innovating batteries from the cell to the pack level. Uh, we have Professor Chaoyang Wang from Penn State University um, who has been doing extremely exciting work on thinking about new ways to improve uh, battery charging capabilities at the cell to pack level. And we also have Mujib Ijaz from our next energy from Michigan, uh, which is also pioneering the design of battery pack that can tremendously increase the energy density at the pack level and also the range for electric vehicle applications. So this is a little bit of a, a different flavor than some of our more chemistry oriented seminar, but I think we will find very exciting connections on how improvements in the chemistry can then be combined with innovations at the pack level to ultimately deliver a pack of unprecedented performance. And we're just really delighted to have both pioneers joining us today. To get us started, uh, let me invite E um, to introduce our first speaker. E, please. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Will. Um, it's uh, my great honor to introduce a friend, uh, Chao Yang Wang. Uh, Chao Yang is a professor at uh, Penn State University at uh, Mechanical Engineering and Chemical and Material Science Engineering. Well, Chao Yang is really an inventor. Uh, he holds over 140 patents, uh, pu publishing uh, more than 220 uh, articles, research articles. Uh, he's known for his innovative work in batteries and also fuel cells. Um, so he, if you look at his uh, inventions, he's just going from uh, uh, <laughs> cover really broad range of topics, uh, all very, very exciting. Uh, for his achievement, he is a fellow of a National Academy of Inventors. He is also a fellow of American Society of Mechanical Engineers. He received uh, many awards, including Research uh, Excellence Award from Field Cell Division of International Association of Hydrogen Energy. Um, certainly, I mean, no further ado, um, and uh, Chao Yang, I'll let you uh, tell us about your recent exciting uh, research. All right, so can you all hear me and see my slide? Yes. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. <clears throat> thank you very much for having me. And I'd like also thank Yi and Will for organizing this uh, wonderful symposium and uh, for inviting me. So the topic I'm going to discuss today is battery fast charging. So here is a, a short outline of my talk, and I will explain my motivation, which has to do with uh, enabling battery or EV affordability and sustainability. I will briefly discuss charging infrastructure and then present uh, the challenge a bit more precisely as well as the underlying scientific issue of lithium plating. Then I will uh, present uh, a brand new figure merit for fast charging and basically used to gauge the effectiveness of fast charging, as well as to review the current state of the art and follow uh, by our approach, which is based on asymmetric temperature modulation. 
And this ATM strategy uh, really utilize a rapid self-heating cell structure uh, in which we can conveniently control SCLA growth as well as tame uh, lesion plating. So at the end, I will present an example of the state-of-the-art fast charging and conclude with some broad uh, messages. All right, so my research into fast charging really is motivated by, motivated by this realization that storing electricity in battery cost, let's say $125 per kilowatt hour, whereas refilling of electricity costs only about 12 cents or so. So we see a 1,000 times price gap between storing or storage and refilling, okay? And that means storage is awfully expensive. And one doesn't want to store any extra electron that are absolutely necessary, right? And this may sound very ironic as we are all storage researchers and uh, practitioners, and we are in this wonderful story symposium, but the plain truth will tell you that any affordable EV simply means a small to medium battery pack, but capable of 10 minute refill of energy or 10 minute <clears throat> fast charging. So this concept can be better illustrated by this schematic as you know, where we basically replace 150 kilowatt hour battery pack by a much slow, smaller one, 50 kilowatt uh, pack, uh, 10 minutes rechargeable. So in the uh, 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 right case, basically you have the 50 kilowatt used up and then wait for 10 minutes, you get another 50 kilowatt and so on and so forth. So that way you still get to use the whole 150 kilowatt hour energy without much inconvenience. And, but on the other hand, you uh, pay only one third of the cost and uh, you consume a third of raw materials and produce a third of carbon emission from manufacturing these small little batteries, right? And so, you know, in a sense, fast charging is a, a very nice enabler of battery affordability and therefore EV affordability, as well as uh, sustainability. So I look into sustainability. It's all about three R words reduce, reuse, and recycle as you know, you can see from, <clears throat> let me bring up a laser maybe. As you can see from this uh, 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 symbols, three symbols all together, wherever you read the textbook or you know, uh, search the internet. But in battery space, we hear reuse and recycle all the time. Somehow we drop, reduce, okay? But the you know, truth of matter is uh, first and foremost, reduce the most effective way to achieve sustainability. And fast charging is a great tool to downsize batteries and therefore reduce raw material consumption and carbon emission from manufacturing batteries. And this is particularly significant at the current times when we face metal shortage crisis and when the industrial uh, CEOs cry for not enough batteries. Right, so the idea really is to share a, a 150 kilowatt of battery pack, uh, uh, originally designed for one EV now with three EVs of 50 kilowatt each. So this reduce alone would be able to support 300 percent organic growth in the number of EVs without consuming additional raw materials or producing additional emissions. Okay, so that is the power of fast charging. Now, here comes a big question for, uh, for us as scientists and, um, and engineers working in this area. And that is, if 50 kilowatt hour battery pack is a new norm, okay, for at least mass, mass market electric vehicles, then what issues and priorities shall we focus on? Still maximizing energy density, as in the vast majority of today's literature and presentations, all start to look for something new and more exciting, right? So that's a big question. Also, if 50 kilowatt hour uh, batteries a new norm, then can we still 
ignore the lithium ion phosphate chemistry because at this size, we all know every batteries can fit very nicely in any passenger cars, uh, both in terms of weight and volume, right? And, you know, with 50 kilowatt hour LP uh, powered vehicles, we probably can get 200 miles. And after 200 miles, if we make those LP batteries 10 minute fast rechargeable, then basically after 200 miles or three hours driving, the driver will go to the restroom and check on social media. And when you come back, the vehicle is ready in 10 minutes for another 200 miles. So essentially don't, you don't have range anxiety anymore. And combining with other attributes like very low cost and high safety, abundant materials or FP, you basically have an ideal solution. Right for sustainable and affordable EVs. So I think we need to seriously consider the FP chemistry in the uh, framework of sustainable batteries. Now, what about fast charging infrastructure? So I look into it, I find it, it's not only available existing, but also over capacity. So let me take Tesla, you know, supercharged network as an example. Each of them has 250 kilowatt can power 5C charging at 50 kilowatt hour, which means they can each can serve five vehicles per hour. And right now it's probably only doing one vehicle per hour, only 20% utilization. So it's largely existing uh, infrastructure is largely underutilized. And similarly for, you know, uh, <clears throat> 350 or to 360 kilowatt DC fast chargers, they're popping up all over the place and uh, they can power 7C charging at 50 kilowatt hour. In other words, serve seven EVs per hour. And that's also larger interlice. So if we just use fully the existing fast charging infrastructure, that's already uh, 500 to 700% uh, growth in the number of EVs without even increasing any infrastructure. Now, beyond that, of course, we can double or triple the Tesla supercharger network. And uh, I, I'm sure that the private companies and uh, government around the world will be able to do that. Okay, so the real challenge really boils down to finding and deploying 10 minutes fast charging batteries. And not only 10 minutes fast charging, but also be able to do so at all temperatures, okay? So here I show you a, a map of average winter temperature in the United States. And you see basically 25 states below zero and 47 states below 10 degrees Celsius. And whereas the uh, fast charging capability is strongly sensitive, very sensitive to ambient temperatures. So I take a snapshot of a Nissan Leaf um, a user manual here. And as you can see, for a normal fast charging at room temperature, cozy temperature takes 30 minutes. It will take 90 minutes if it's <clears throat> sub-zero temperature. So uh, we need to find a technology that can do fast charging in Alaska throughout the year, as well as in Phoenix, right? And the scientific issue underlying fast charging is this uh, a phenomenon called lithium plating. So when I apply a very large current, you have a huge uh, uh, flux of lithium ions generated from cathode and they have to return into the anode. And so much ion don't have time to be nicely integrated into graphite host. So instead they were deposit as lithium metal on the surface of graphite particle, and that is irreversible, causing capacity decay as well as uh, is a um, safety hazard. So lithium plating are mostly prone to occur under uh, high charge rate, obviously, and low temperatures, and as well as very thick electrode or high area capacity, which leads to high energy density or low cost. So we want all this problem to be solved, okay? Now, uh, understandably, fast charging is a pretty um, messy word. In other words, in terms of the literature, you have many claims and you have patent literature and academic literature because, you know, fast charging is desired 
for decades or for centuries, ever since uh, batteries uh, uh, were invented, right? And time is money. So charging, fast charging is always designed. So uh, uh, with all this much uh, literature, so we decide to put out a uh, new figure of merit to gauge the effectiveness of uh, fast charging. And we also use it to evaluate the current status of the literature so we can, you know, uh, position ourselves better for the future development. Now, this figure Mary consists of three metric parameters, charge time on the horizontal axis, obviously, right? And then the vertical axis is energy acquired by such fast charging in watt hour per kg, okay? And one can also use, you know, aerial capacity uh, acquired by fast charging in milliamp hour per kg. It's the same thing. And, uh, uh, that is important because you, you need a sufficient energy for automotive driving. And then the third parameter is basically the number of fast charge cycles. And that is a measure of life and, and, and represented by the size of the bubble on, on that plot. So here I show you two, a pair of uh, figures. And uh, on the left, you basically have the data points or the technologies with cycle number exceeding 800 so-called automotive target. And then on the right, you have uh, more or less emerging chemistry and system that has you know, a cycle number still short of automotive target. In each of the figure, I also have a few shaded areas and the upper uh, left uh, uh, corner here is what we define uh, as automotive acceptable box for fast charging, basically defined by less than 15 minute charge time and more than 200 watt hour per kg acquired energy. And uh, within this box, there is an ideal target located here with this, you know, sizable bubble. So meaning it has to be long lasting even uh, 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 after fast charging. And then we have a few other shaded areas. And uh, here is a lower corner here, the LTO chemistry or the battery using LTO material, which basically is so-called no string material. So uh, 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 particularly suitable for fast charging. And, uh, and then, but the energy density is a little low and uh, you know, uh, not very useful for automotive driving. Uh, but then if you replace the anode with graphite, you start to get this range of energy density with the lower limit more defined by FP cathode and high limited by high uh, nickel uh, NMC cathode. And, and then if you further replace with silicon uh, uh, anode, then you get another bump in energy density. And if you do lithium metal anode, you get further increase in energy density all the way into 400 watt hour per kg area, okay? And then in addition, you see three groups of data here. And uh, this very gigantic uh, uh, orange bubble basically is LTO battery. As expected, very durable and you can cycle many times. You can charge in less than five minutes. But again, unfortunately, the energy density is a little low. And then you have here a bunch of graphite-based uh, uh, lithium-ion batteries and making steady progress and start to enter this automotive box for the very first time. So I will explain a little bit more details uh, shortly about this group of uh, 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 research. And then up here, you uh, this blue uh, symbol, this blue dot is basically for uh, lithium metal uh, solid state uh, batteries. And you can see uh, uh, there's significant amount of energy acquired uh, after charging, but the charge still takes several hours, okay? Now in the emerging uh, chemistry or system area, uh, basically by and large, you see all those bubbles, tiny, teeny, and those are need, you know, uh, basic meaning there's not in a sufficient life and we need to improvement. Uh, in particular, you see those, there's a few uh, pink points here and they all have a little bit too small bubbles and uh, uh, meaning that the uh, cycle life is too short and that is consistent with the biggest uh, issue facing silicon anode battery, uh, basically they are lacking the, the sufficient calendar life. And, and therefore I think dealing with uh, stability and durability of silicon 
a battery is still uh, the biggest challenge before we consider fast charging. And for the lithium uh, metal batteries, you also see a few data points spreading around. And probably the closest to this automotive box is this work by Lang et al. And they acquire 300 watt hour per kg energy. It takes one hour, one C charging. Okay, so that's the current state of that. What about future? And as we know, RPA-E currently has uh, uh, ongoing uh, FOA, uh, which basically calling for two targets in two categories. And both targets can be very nicely displayed in this figure, Mary. The first one is uh, uh, demanding uh, five minute charging, acquiring 160 watt hour per kg. And the second one is 15 minute charge and uh, calling for uh, 320 what our per kg. So now with all these data points, you see this is our current state of the art, what we can realize today. And then there's two near-term target. Those three data points really form the battlefront to tackle this ideal target. And they are getting very close. So I'm very confident that this ideal target of automotive fast charging will be realized in near term. Now, how do we do fast charging? It's different from the literature, um, uh, other people's work. It's uh, a physics method based on the so-called asymmetric temperature modulation. And it, it can be illustrated here. So we basically leave the battery alone during operation, let's say rest or discharge or you know, as usual at the ambient temperature. But whenever you bring an empty, temp uh, empty battery to a fast charger, we will give a quick preheating to an elevated temperature like 60 degrees Celsius. And then at that elevated temperature, we enjoy enhanced kinetics and transport and therefore eliminate lithium plating and then do the 10 minute fast charging, finish it up. And once it's done, then the battery will naturally cool down and you go back to you know, your normal business of operating the battery. So the key here really is to control the time for the battery to expose to elevated temperature. But fortunately, this is a 10 minute fast charging. So very short. And uh, technologically, a key element is really to find a structure or a way to rapidly heat up the cell. And it has to be you know, done with a heating speed uh, greater than one degree per second, or be able to heat up from room temperature to 60 degrees Celsius in less than a minute, right? Because charging time is only 10 minutes. So we have to keep it quick. And uh, conventionally heating is done externally and uh, either by circulating warm fluid or by um, put a external heater and those are all very slow process and typically <clears throat> at a speed of 0 0.5 degree per minute and for going from room temperature to 60 degrees Celsius will take already about an hour, okay? So, and this is why Tesla has this so-called on route battery warm up strategy. In other words, if a driver needs to go get a fast charge, you have to tell the vehicle ahead of time, hopefully 45 to 60 minutes ahead of time, push the button. And then by the time you arrive there, the battery is warm enough to do a supercharge. Now in our uh, 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 research, we use a, a uh, self-heating structure, which we first published uh, in uh, 2016. So it's actually a very simple construction. You take a pouch cell, which is typically 10 millimeter thick, and then you insert a nickel foil, which is only 10 micron thickness, and as shown here as a yellow sheet here. And this, you know, there's two ends of the nickel foil. One is welded into a negative terminal and other is, uh, sticking out to form a third terminal we call activation terminal. And then you place a switch between positive and activation terminal. And you take this such a battery to uh, uh, a charger and connect it as usual. So positive, negative. Now, before you do the charging, you basically turn on the switch and therefore the charge current will all flow through the nickel foil to preheat the cell from whatever ambient temperature to 60, let's say. And after the 
charge temperature is reached, you turn off the switch and then the ch same charge current start to charge the battery material. So it's only one, one key action and you will be able to accomplish this uh, process very quickly. Uh, here I use a schematic to show the advantages of ATM methods. And uh, you know, essentially we want to eliminate lithium plating while limiting ACLA growth. So if you plot the reactivity of power level of battery versus the time throughout the lifetime, so obviously during uh, you know, normal driving time, the battery is designed to output the sufficient power for driving at ambient temperature. So nothing is changed. But once you come to the high power fast charger, you will receive a, your cells will receive a quick thermal stimulation in less than one minute. And then at this elevated temperature, which will give you a, a superior power level suitable for fast charging without listen plating, and you finish the 10 minute fast charging after that, and you go back to the normal driving and the cells will quickly cool down to ambient, towards ambient temperature. Okay. So in this case, yes, we do have de uh, accelerated degradation, degradation during elevated temperature period, but as long as we control time, we can limit this growth. So at the end, uh, you know, at this ATM mode, the battery capacity retention is a function of SCLA growth at 60 degrees Celsius, and then the degree of lithium plating, whether we can reduce it or eliminate it, as well as some little other miscellaneous factors, we all remain the same as in other normal conditions, okay? Now, how do we uh, limit SCLA growth at elevated temperature? We did a lot of characterizations for a large number of materials, okay? The figure on the left is for NMCA11 graphite cells. We put them in constant 60 degrees Celsius oven and cycle uh, all of them so that you, we know we, we, we know the ACI layer uh, induced degradation at elevated temperature. And those are for very thick uh, electrode, 4.2 uh, milliamp hour per square centimeter loading, 1C, 1C cycling, or medium 3.4 uh, loading, but with the same active material, same BET area, and therefore they are ACI layer. Uh, uh, characteristic remain the same. Also, we deal with different electrolytes. And as you can see, all the data collapse on one single curve between the capacity retention and the time. Okay. And as a matter of fact, following nearly square root of time as we would expect. Okay. So at this point, you can see that it's all about time. Similarly, our early data using NMC 523 graphite cell doing the same thing. The blue symbols are basic constant uh, oven uh, testing at 60 degrees Celsius. And the red ones are ATM operation, they, which do the 6C charging at 60 degrees Celsius. And 1C discharge at much lower temperature. Uh, but still, you know, uh, at the very beginning, and you basically see those two data uh, coincide with each other. And it's all about time. So time will decide the capacity retention. Now, how much time do we actually stay at 60 degrees in our operation? Let's say we do you know, 1,000 fast charge cycles. And uh, each cycle you have 10 minutes, 1,000. So total time is 167 hours throughout the lifetime. And that time at elevated temperature is only a tiny fraction of battery lifetime. And if I plot that ATM time staying at 60 degrees Celsius over this, you know, this two plot, you can see the resulting capacity retention is still far above, way above the 80% limit, right? Now this is a 1,000 all fast charging, all staying at 60 degrees Celsius. If we follow USABC criterion, which only require 25% fast charging cycles, and then this will be reducing by factor four, the total time reduced by factor four. And we'll be talking about something like 40 hours and here. So capacity retention is not an issue. Now, what about our ability to uh, eliminate lithium plating? As we know, it's all controlled by three processes. Iron transport, 
uh, through this very thick negative uh, electrolyte uh, uh, in the electro uh, 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 negative electrode in the electrolyte, and then you uh, have charge transfer reaction at the graphite surface, and followed by the third step, which is lithium atom diffusion in uh, graphite particles. And all those three processes can be greatly enhanced by higher temperature. So, as showing data here, but the simple message is that if we go from 20 to 60 degrees Celsius, in other words, thermal stimulation, we will acquire a novel electrolyte, as if novel electrolyte with doubling conductivity. And we will create a novel graphite material with six times improved diffusivity within. And we also develop a and en engineered uh, interface with for uh, with twelve times improved charge transfer kinetics. So one single action of thermal stimulation creates uh, three as if new materials, and that is the power of uh, ATM. Okay, so we uh, with with all these uh, uh, powerful uh, uh, principles and mechanisms, and then we can, you know, uh, carry out the fast charging in numerous uh, systems involving many different materials. So here I give you one example, uh, which involves 270 watt hour per kg NMC A11 graphite cell, and we can put it at a 4C fast charging to 75 percent SOC and uh, acquire energy at the beginning of life is a little over 200 watt hour per kg. And you can see that we can say easily cycle 900 times, right? Now, if we take the same cell, do the 4C charge only to 70 percent SOC, then the uh, acquire energy is a little bit lower, not 190. But then you can cycle much longer beyond 1700. Okay, so those both set of data now put it together to uh, in comparison with the DOE target showing here as a dash line. Okay, so it's a, a, a practical method. And if you look at the detailed voltage, cell voltage, and temperature curves, uh, it's very interesting. First of all, you see a one period preheating takes about less than one minute, and uh, in which basically cell voltage remains the same. There's virtually no electrochemical activity. It's just a charge current passing through the nickel foil preheat the cell from ambient to 65 degrees Celsius rapidly. Okay. Then after that, switches off and you charge current is charging the battery. Voltage goes up and you charge it to 70% or 75%. And after short rest and followed by C over three discharge and nicely output the energy. Okay. Now, if you look at the temperature curves, and first you see amazing result. You see during 4C high current charging, the cell temperature would remain nearly at 65 degrees Celsius, despite the fact that the cell, the test cell, is sitting in a stagnant room air. So, in other words, there's no liquid cooling and there's no even fan blowing. Uh, 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 air towards the cell. So it's all under natural convection. And you can still be able to dissipate a very large amount of internal heat generation. And the reason being very simple, it's basically the temperature difference driving heat generation is huge. The cell is at 65, and ambient is 25. Okay, So you enjoy a very large temperature, delta T basically. And then after you, uh, you know, fast charge, you will follow by C over three discharge. This is a mi mimicking a situation where we leave a fast charge station and then we start to drive over the highway at, at a speed limit. In other words, consume the entire cruise range within three hours, right? And that's really the uh, speed limit. Even if you do so, you see the cell temperature will drop very quickly to below 40 degrees Celsius in about eight minutes in this case. It's all natural convection, nothing. 
right? And, and uh, below which basically we know the cells are very safe. Now we can significantly reduce this cooling time, eight minutes to maybe a couple of minutes if we activate the so-called aspirated air convection. So in other words, you know, open the valve and then the, uh, with a driving on highway, you basically get air sucking to cool the battery pack automatically. So the message really is, can be summarized as, you know, right now we can do around 10 minute fast charging and acquire 200 watt hour per kg, be able to cycle more than 1,000 and under the passive cooling condition, okay? So it's all those, you know, basically metrics all together. Now, um, I just want to touch up on, uh, uh, very briefly about uh, safety uh, consequence of fast charging. In other words, relationship between fast charging and safety, right? And this can be illustrated by, again, by this uh, sketch, uh, plotting the reactivity power level versus temperature, cell temperature. Now, if you prefer a quantitative way, you can also use the inverse of DCR, uh, uh, DC resistance or internal resistance of the battery. Okay, and for state of our battery, basically showing as a you know green curve here, and and uh, as we all know, you know uh, those batteries are designed to provide enough power level for driving around room temperature, twenty five degrees Celsius, and then as the temperature goes up, the reactivity increase, power level increase, and then there's a safe limit, and beyond which you start to see the onset of thermal run away. So we are not supposed to exceed this safety limit. Now, if you do fast charging, the reactivity of power level has to be higher than driving, uh, but lower than safety limit. So somewhere around here. So obviously, in order to uh, uh, design or develop a fast charging uh, batteries using whatever new materials we invent, uh, we, will, we have to e uh, increase this uh, reactivity level or inversely decrease the DCR in uh, manifold, okay? And that can be, uh, oops. Uh, so that can be uh, illustrated by uh, this uh, new curve. So you have to shift it out upwards, either by uh, higher reactivity or by lower uh, DCR uh, tremendously, okay? And then uh, this is also necessary, better understood if we know that, uh, you know, the normal battery can be charged in 1C. If you apply 4C, we got to reduce the DCR by a factor of 4 uh, before the charge voltage will jump right away, reach the upper limit and shut down everything, right? So it's necessary. And by doing so, the consequence uh, we have to consider after all this method is the premature onset of thermal rate. Right? Now, the... Uh, ATM method uh, uh, treat this uh, uh, fast charging versus safety relation differently. We don't change the materials or chemistry. And so the, this curve remains the same. And what we do is before you, uh, when you bring the battery to a fast charger and we will give a uh, rapid preheating from whatever ambient temperature to a uh, elevated temperature uh, or charging temperature. And so that you have sufficient uh, reactivity, which will support the fast charging. Once you finish it and the battery nat naturally cool down and you go back to the, do the normal business. And so you still remain in this curve and uh, uh, thermal runaway, onset of thermal runaway remain the same. So without compromising the safety. Now, let me quickly just uh, uh, put up some uh, uh, broad messages. I think uh, uh, for us as a researchers, uh, a, a battery electric chemistry R and D should include how to include uh, how to maximize energy storage, but also how to maximize the rate of charge turnover, uh, because this is a very low cost method to get things done. Right. So for industrial community, of course, there's a multiple uh, opportunity to monetize this archer low cost fast charging. Why well, still enjoy double win in sustainability? So if you downsize, you will be able to reduce raw materials, carbon emissions, as well as increase utilization of charging infrastructure. And for those fast charge batteries to be deployed uh, in the marketplace, we should have no less safety. Safety cannot be compromised and preferably 
do not demand more cooling. That will cost money, right? So the whole message is less is more. I think we can get things done with a small to medium battery pack. And that small to medium battery cap, uh, 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 battery pack can already achieve cost parity with gasoline cars, especially the uh, LP chemistry. And uh, so with that, I want to thank, uh, acknowledge the support, funding support uh, for my research from DOE, also Argonne National Lab, who conducted the third party independent uh, evaluation of our technology, uh, Defender Endowment, uh, at Penn State Air Force SBR 1, 2, and then a large number of people at Penn State and the EC Power uh, teams and who uh, helped me to learn and, uh, you know, basically uh, 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 understand this uh, uh, asymmetric, asymmetric temperature modulation method for fast charging. Uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Well, Chao Yang, thank you very much for the uh, very interesting talk. Uh, very cool idea here, or say hot idea. <laughs> um, so why don't we, let, let's uh, ask a few questions right here for the time consideration, probably we will not, not ask for too long. Uh, Chao Yang, uh, the first question is about um, implementation of this idea. Uh, let's see. Um, it's uh, it requires three terminal of the battery cell. Uh, maybe cylinder cell will be harder to implement. This is more like a, you know prismatic pouch cell type of configuration. Uh, do you foresee the challenge uh, in the battery manufacturing, or or if this is all set? Yeah, this will be a good opportunity. I think audience probably wants to know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is a great question. I think uh, obviously this is, you know, uh, added uh, procedure uh, to the existing uh, fabrication uh, 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 production line. Uh, but I think that fortunately I, I, it works well with the trend of uh, a cell fabrication. As we know, you know, all the cells are going towards the so-called bigness, right? We see the blade cell. We, we basically see all the cell made, in, uh, made bigger and bigger and with much more space for a third terminal. And, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and single cells are made much bigger. So 150 amp hour, even 200 amp hour. So this is a pretty ample space for, for to install a small terminal. That's one. And second, uh, it's actually this uh, 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 configuration has been a pilot produced uh, for uh, the uh, uh, Winter Olympics uh, just, uh, you know, the, in the past uh, February. So it was, uh, uh, you know, the whole pack was uh, installing about uh, 200 or 500 vehicles, uh, I forgot, electric buses and, and commuting in, in the Winter Olympic uh, uh, competing sites uh, in, in Beijing in, in the past February. So I, I, I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it requires some work, but I think it's, it's a small engineering kind of thing. Yeah, congratulations, Chao Yang. That's very impressive to see this is uh, implemented in uh, Beijing uh, Winter Olympics. Um, second question from the audience. Um, certainly the cool down time you show about eight minutes. Uh, this depends on the size of the cell, probably mostly the thickness of the cell. Uh, any comment on the size of the cells effect on the cooling time? Um, yeah, that's another good, great question. So uh, 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 we tend to think uh, the cooling time is depending on the sickness, but the modern way of cooling or thermal management is not through much sickness. In other words, it's not through the electro separator assembly because the, the, the thermal conductivity along that direction, we call it uh, 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 through plane direction is very low. In comparison, the in plane direction along the uh, foils or the electrodes, uh, for, let's say take a cylindrical cell as an example from 
uh, top to bottom, that is almost 10 times higher. And that is has nothing to do with the thickness of the cell, whether you make a thicker cylindrical cell or a, or a tiny 18650, they remain the same. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, we actually rely on, I think what you mean is because this carbon collector metallic foil probably conducted the heat to the edge a lot faster than, you know, across the perpendicular to the separator and so on. Yeah, exactly. Try to add the conductors through many, many layers of separators. Yeah. Okay, that's great. So tell me another question. Uh, I'm keep wondering, right? You use 60 degrees C. Certainly the temperature gives you a fast kinetics. Uh, you know, that's the main mechanism. But 60 degrees C is also more than a usual. I mean, the usual can, can change. Uh, this uh, threshold, maybe 55. Uh, why not using kind of 55 or below, maybe 50 to play safe, then you don't lose that capacity that much. I understand 10 degrees Celsius, kinetics change quite a bit. So, so what about 50, 50 degrees Celsius instead of 60? Yeah, I, uh, that's a, also a very good question. Obviously, you know, the charge temperature is variable. I mean, you can do 45, 55. And, uh, and even 70, 80 and so on, depending on materials and systems. And if you talk about solid state, I probably can go up to 80 and 90 degrees Celsius. So it's a, it's a scalable and it can be uh, even uh, uh, reconfigured on board. Uh, it's, it's very easy to do, right? Now I, I mentioned 60, I just try to challenge the, the, the conventional kind of mentality. I think it's time for us to, uh, change that kind of mentality for two reasons. Number one, and I, I think we all believe, uh, we all agree that battery safety is, is very, very important. And therefore, a battery have to be heat resistant. So if you, if we researchers and developers and manufacturers are still very much afraid of 60 degrees Celsius, there's probably no hope to have a safe batteries uh, in the future. Right, so we have to overcome that kind of our own kind of limitation, and that's one thing. And second thing is, uh, I can tell you, I only stay at sixty degrees Celsius for about one hundred sixty hours. And most recently, uh, you know, uh, Professor Jeff Dang actually stayed in seventy degrees Celsius, constant seventy degrees Celsius over for over six months. And he still emerged out of that, you know, uh, uh, stay uh, safely and with very little aging. So I think I think we 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 uh, this is an evolving uh, uh, understanding, and uh, I think more and more so for the future, we got to be able to embrace more heat resistant batteries and. And, yeah. and, and I think 60 really is probably not a big issue. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I asked one last question and then invite we'll, we'll chair to moderate the next talk. Um, so Chao Yang, these uh, heating going really fast, one minute and also involving cooling uh, later that eight minutes, may, maybe for bigger size cell, a little bit longer. So during this process, this, is there any concern of uh, temperature in homogeneity uh, of uh, particularly when you heat it up uh, and then you do charging, right? I mean, globally, it looks stable temperature. <clears throat> it's just local temperature variation uh, uh, to be yeah. a potential concern or, or maybe the, because you have the foil right there. I'm trying to think you have the foil right there. You do the dual heating. The, the current path, is there anything spatially can cause the temperature variation slightly? That, that uh, might cause the, uh, you know, induce the uh, plating issue because of temperature variation in the same cell, yeah. Good point. Um, that can be managed. Uh, 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 for example, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned we have one foil in a pouch cell, 10 millimeters thick. And if you have, you know, 30 millimeter thick prismatic cell, even thicker cells, we put, you know, two or three foils. And we can even put the foils between two jelly rolls because those, you know, big fat uh, battery cells are made of uh, many jelly rolls also. 
So you can insert, you, you basically can, can distribute, you can think about it, slice one nickel foil into a few slices, insert in you know, uh, different locations, and then you have very uniform uh, temperature distribution during uh, heating. Now cooling, we rely on, like I said, this very high, highly conductive uh, 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 current collector foils. And, and that's not a problem because after, I mean, cooling is basically also volumetrically. Thank you so much, Chao Yang. Uh, uh, why don't we move on to the next talk? Uh, and if you can stay with us, so after uh, Majid uh, is just talk, uh, we can come back to have a small panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Will, back to you. Thank you, Yi and Chao Yang. Thank you for this very uh, disruptive presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. And from one disruptive idea to another one, um, let me now also invite Majib to come to the stage. Thank you so much, Majib. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, to introduce a true veteran in the um, battery and electric vehicle industry. Um, so Mujib has a long standing career uh, in the auto industry and in the battery industry starting um, 30 years ago uh, at Ford uh, developing uh, electrified vehicles uh, both involving batteries um, and, and fuel cells. And um, he then moved on um, eventually to lead uh, as CTO of A123 uh, systems uh, to develop innovative battery technologies there from the cell level and up. And then, um, and after that, um, he decided to uh, come out here to the West Coast and join Apple to work on some very special ideas. Um, and uh, that brought us to the pandemic. And many of us are struggling during the pandemic, but Mujib, uh, you know, decided to and start a company uh, in, the, I think it was June of 2020, uh, just at the onset of the pandemic, truly inspirational, uh, what you have accomplished over the past two years. And um, today, I think Mujib will share with us um, technical details of the technologies that he has been developing with his team at our Next Energy. And I just want to say that it's rare to have a person with this diverse experience in the battery and EV industry uh, really looking at all the way from materials to sell to pack. And I think that really resonates with our um, belief at Storage X, where we have to have a, a systematic approach and looking at the systems level, how to connect everything. So Mujib, we're really great. It's re really our great pleasure to host you here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. And it's great to be with uh, the panel here at Storage X. Uh, I actually, uh, when I kind of reflect on the many interactions that I've had uh, being in uh, California and, and meeting uh, Professor uh, uh, William uh, and his, uh, Chu and his team and his startup uh, was also an inspiration. I, I know that there's a lot going on in the battery and energy storage world these days that's evolving the mindset around uh, development of chemistry as well as supply chain and then architecture. And so I'm happy to be here and share with you what we're thinking about at Our Next Energy. And so let me uh, share my screen and I'll get my uh, presentation up here as well. So as, uh, as William introduced the background just briefly, my career over 30 years uh, sort of ebbed and flowed between uh, battery technologies that were very advanced, like the first one that I worked on in Ford was sodium sulfur to then um, due to safety and some three fires that happened in the early 90s, retreated very quickly to the safest and most conservative approaches like lead acid and nickel metal hydride. And this early part of my career, um, you know, got kind of interrupted as I was really well convinced in electric vehicle that we could, um, you know, create an electrified platform that would satisfy the market. Uh, fuel cells were brought in in the late 90s to try to overcome a range problem. And there was at least 10 years spent working on uh, developing solutions that could get to zero emissions with range. And I, I, I start my talk with that story because in some ways we're still working to advance technologies that satisfy the full market. 
And one of our vision points at Our Next Energy is that we think we need to be able to double the range of where we are with today's electric vehicles to get to the mass market that's out there. And that's not a well-established or well-accepted premise because ne needing to double the range of electric vehicles from where we are today sounds like we need six, 700 miles of rated capability. And, and many OEMs would argue with me that that's number one, way too much cost to put on board a vehicle. Uh, number two, why would you carry around so much range if the average customer's expectations for range today are in the three to 400 mile range, uh, levels. And so I'm gonna talk a lot about that, but really founding the company on the premise of needing to double the range of electric vehicles also came with a discussion at our early stage of what are the chemistries that we want to put our effort behind. And while we didn't select an exact chemistry that we would put our effort behind, we did select that we would not put effort around cobalt. We think cobalt is a long-term supply chain problem and cobalt is, exists in nickel cobalt chemistries because it is a stabilizing force, but in electric vehicle terms, the level of market adoption and the level of need in the global community of uh, um, electrified platforms, the, the cobalt supply chain constraints are not going to be able to keep up with demand to such a degree that we believe the cobalt market will become a barrier for electric vehicles. But in addition to that, the nickel cobalt manganese family of chemistries that are being pursued, and I'll add NCA to that as well, have a risk of thermal runaway and self-oxidation. And so we decided, let's just make a premise that we're gonna avoid nickel cobalt for supply chain and security reasons. And our third goal was to develop a sustainable su supply chain that could be mapped globally to the local markets that we go into. Specifically, North America does not have a robust supply chain. And so we decided to go after developing solutions to the problem. So if I now go back to the 30 years that I've been um, watching the industry and participating in the industry of electrification, this map is a range of vehicles and battery technologies that have evolved since the very early 90s. And if you look at the uh, lead acid dots in the very bottom left, uh, Ranger EV for Ford and EV1 for GM were two examples of vehicles that were working through development of an early market that might be constrained by range, but at least there was some attempt to get over 100 miles of range but as I look at the you know, real evolution, it's the last decade and maybe less than a decade that have adopted the nickel cobalt family of chemistries almost to an exclusive degree. Every major successful electric vehicle today is using nickel cobalt in some form. And uh, vehicles like the Nissan Leaf and others, the GM Spark that used LFP or uh, LMO those vehicles are no longer considered to be competitive because the adoption rates for vehicles that use nickel cobalt getting above 300 miles range um, have shown the, the market acceptance is much better. And if you look at the left chart, you know, the EPA rated range is a very big discussion point when consumers are thinking about which electric car to buy. And as we, you know, study that, and especially in the early phases of the company back in 2020 when it, when it was founded, we wanted to actually develop a target. Like if we're gonna go after a battery system, what should that target be to get to the mass market? And so we pulled a study and uh, it was a 14,500 person survey. And the question was, effect, one of the questions was effectively at what range level do you consider an electric vehicle your only vehicle? Then that's quite different than the early market where people will adopt an electric car because they want the electric car and they're going to be willing to deal with compromise. And for example, Nissan Leaf had a pretty significant market and it was very successful in the early market, but it was a niche market. It was an early loyal following of electrification that generated that market, not necessarily the mass market where people have 
constrain their buying decisions around certain requirements, range being one of them. And so in that survey, what it suggested is that between 450 and 600 miles of range, the market no longer cares what you know, the range number is. Uh, it's basically now moved on to other factors in the buying decision like price and product mix and capabilities and platform choice and even brand. But the range number needs to be that high to get to the full market, 75 to let's say nearly 100% of the market needs range numbers above 450 miles for that one or two times per year excursion. But if you go deeper, the situation, and by the way, it looks like in this case of mass market, we're not that far away from the mass market, but uh, we actually have modeled that we're actually further away than most OEMs are admitting or letting on. And the reason for that is the real world range numbers are significantly lower than the EPA rating, especially when you get into the most common feature of having range is taking a long distance trip. Now, if you go Metro highway, uh, if you go into just city mode, vehicles that are driving around, you know, San Francisco Bay area or LA or any of these other Metro areas are oftentimes constrained to stop and go driving and low speeds. And at that level, electric vehicle efficiency and prediction of EPA range are well aligned. You capture regen braking, you're not going very fast, so aerodynamic drag isn't a problem. But when you get onto the highway and your speed limits have grown from 55 two decades ago to now even 85 or 80 miles per hour in some states, you go to Texas, you can do 85 miles per hour in the legal speed limit. That, that market of truck and Texas and being able to do 85 miles per hour on a trip, it needs to be considered when advertising what your range numbers are. And I, I would actually say that my one third off from EPA to range, uh, real world is a very generous uh, estimation. Actually, I think it's 50%. You can lose 50% of EPA rated range by driving at highway speeds like 85 miles per hour with some climate control uh, heating or cooling in, included. And if you add terrain like living in Colorado or even a small terrain uh, state like Kentucky, that's going to dramatically affect your ability to achieve your goals. And so what we decided to do is plot the percentage of market willing to adopt against real world range. And we decided at 33% reduction on EPA would be a, a good starting point. And four to 500 miles, getting just above that 70 to now 95% of the market, we think that uh, going after an energy density goal or the ability to achieve our 450 watt hour per liter, 300 watt hours per kilogram would become the system level target that our next energy would go after. So with that goal in mind, we set that goal, I think in uh, August of 2020, uh, shortly after we were founded, uh, we decided to then take a look at benchmarking and understanding where are the best battery packs in the world uh, with respect to achieving that goal. And if we look at the NCM and NCA batteries of the world, the best batteries out there were around 230 watt hours per liter, 44% um, of the battery pack, the exterior volume was cells to so sell the pack of 44%. Uh, typical battery pack sizing of 80 kilowatt hours, 330 liters, and about 2000 cycles of capability. That describes a lot of batteries that are in uh, using pouch cells and metal can prismatic. The cylindrical cells that are being used by Tesla the battery packs were also at around 235 watt hours per liter, but it had only a 32% cell to pack. Uh, the packing ratio of cell to pack got worse, but the energy density inside the cell got better. But ne nevertheless, the net result is what the OEMs care about is at system level 230. And so remember my target of 450, that means that we're actually aiming to double the amount of energy in the same space uh, to satisfy the market. Now, if you look at the uh, NCA-NCM chemistry um, 
uh, platform, if you have a failure and a cell goes into thermal runaway, that will quickly lead to a cascading effect of that consuming modules. And I would say that the prevention of thermal runaway, once you've included four or five or 10 kilowatt hours of energy going rapidly into thermal runaway, it is not possible to stop that at a uh, pack level without very significant controls. And in tearing down at least a dozen battery packs, I don't see significant controls being used in the pack level to prevent that from becoming a pack fire and eventually a vehicle fire. And we see that, you know, we see that there are recalls that are happening. There are NHTSA investigations. There are shutdowns of various programs that have used large format cells because of thermal runaway and nickel cobalt related chemistries. And so what our company decided to do is charter a course without nickel cobalt where we actually employ lithium iron phosphate or LFP. And in making LFP a, a root chemistry and deciding that that was a sustainable chemistry, it was good for mining, good for CO2 emissions, good for product safety and good for cost. We decided that we would turn the equation around a good systems engineering approach is to ask a question that, okay, if I want that chemistry, what is the necessary attribute that I need to achieve at a system level to enable that chemistry to exceed the market in today's nickel cobalt terms. And so setting a target for a new battery that we called Aries was one of our objectives. The second was setting a target for a second battery concept, Gemini, which I mentioned at 450 watt hours per liter. And we decided in that battery, we called it Gemini because it's a twin, is it uses one battery for daily driving using LFP, and then it uses a second chemistry for range extension, like an onboard power supply through a DC to DC converter. And that gave us the ability to start enabling very sustainable and non self-oxidizing cathodes that would then help with safety cost and still not give up on the range goals. Now, in order for Aries to exist, we would have to go after a very high cell to pack to make lithium iron phosphate viable. Uh, we calculated out that we'd have to be at 76% cell to pack in order to enable a 287 watt hour per liter performance at a system level with LFP chemistry. And if I show you the breakdown, what you can see on the left is a Volkswagen, uh, and this is by the way, a pretty common architecture uh, pouch cells go into modules, modules go into pack. That architecture results in a typical NCM cell at around 530 watt hours per liter, losing much of its energy density through cell to pack at only 43%, but also gravimetrically at 66%. So the net result is a 236 watt hour per liter system level performance of energy density and 169 in, in gravimetric terms. What we've done we, with leveraging LFP and a high cell to pack is retain uh, a much higher fraction of the initial cell chemistry's capability at 379 watt hours per liter, which is a very good chemistry achievement for LFP. In the days that I ran uh, product development at A123, I think it was around 220 watt hours per liter. And the cell was maybe a little more optimized for power because the battery packs were very small. Today's LFP, which are being optimized exclusively for energy in that level of energy density, um, 379 is a really good number. And if we can maintain 76% of that flowing to the bottom line, then we can enable a higher performing LFP pack using cell to pack as an architectural shift. Now, as we uh, look at our uh, Aries pack in physical terms, what that meant is uh, we had to go through quite a lot of pain on enclosure design and compression design and welding and making sure that we have bonded, bonded welded and, and permanently integrated product, also separating out the battery management system so that it could individually and separately be serviced in that front unit. And so the architecture of the battery had a lot of pain to go through to enable that. But the net result is we have a very successful uh, energy density now using lithium iron phosphate. 
Now, if we look at the landscape, we have the second dot on the graph, which is the Gemini uh, or the second uh, battery product. And, and really thinking about Gemini is that now that we have a cell to pack model or a mindset, we can use a dual battery architecture to start enabling a much higher range number than was previously uh, enabled with other approaches. And so let's now study the uh, chart on the right first, which is customer behavior, and then we'll go to the chart on the left. So if you look at the chart on the right, the, the average daily dri driven distance for an electric vehicle in the United States market is just less than 50 miles, it's that dotted line. And that is the average where, you know, if you go to a Metro highway model and people working in cities and, you know, you don't want to be in your car all day. So it makes sense that your commute is, you know, in the neighborhood of half an hour each way. Um, that, that gives you a way to think about the early adopters mindset, but really getting to 99% of daily use is the better way where you really get to the full market approach where 150 miles a day would satisfy 99% of the use case of the market. And in that context, it's why early electric vehicles are able to get a market, but the real decision to buy an electric vehicle, this is the emotional factor, and it goes into the studies that we've read, is that people think about that once a year, twice a year, the uncertainty of charging or the hassle of stopping the charge too often and they just want the range number to be so far out there that it doesn't get in the way of, um, you know, the convenience of being able to just get where you're going. And by the way, anyone that, you know, will try to argue back that, well, you know, it's not that big of a deal to stop and charge. Think about brands like Uber, Instacart, Amazon that are making their uh, fortunes out of convenience for customer mindset. Everyone's trying to find a way to resolve their lifestyle with, out obstacles and fast charging while it's effective sometimes is really a band-aid to the ultimate solution of just give me enough range to get where I'm going so I don't need to interrupt my effort to get there. So that purchase decision being uh, wrapped up into the big range number, we started realizing uh, at the early part of the company's founding that we could divide a battery into two specific chemistry objectives. The left one, the blue one, is going to be very durable, very significant in terms of depth of discharge capability, power capability, and delivering a daily use case. And then the right hand, the yellow battery, only needs to be used maybe four times a year, thinking about the one percentile. And we went ahead and tripled that and said, let's use it 12 times a year. But even at 12 times a year, you only need a couple hundred cycles of capability for that range extender. And so now we go to the left chart and the left chart is scientifically always been true. Whether it's when I started my career in 1990 at uh, Ford and coming out of Virginia Tech in a solar car or go back to Thomas Edison's earliest batteries in the late 1800s, early 1900s for electric vehicle. There's always been this, this topic where a new chemistry emerges on the left, meaning cycle life's not proven, and its energy density is high. And then it's hard to migrate from the emergence of a new chemistry that's very, like elevated performance is exciting to automotive requirements where you're gonna need lots of cycles, lots of durability, lots of power, lots of temperature uh, robustness. You have a lot of requirements around automotive that are tough. And that's why automotive doesn't have but a library of four or five chemistries that are really used every day. And maybe it's even three chemistries that are widely used. It's because maturing a chemistry to automotive can take at least a decade. And that's the quest I'm on right now is our next energy thinks that we can accelerate the adoption of new chemistries by decoupling the daily driver and making that lithium iron phosphate and that blue section is 150 miles in the battery pack. And then we can make a choice of the most significant and best chemistries that are emerging for very high energy density. And those would be, for example, 200 cycles would be enough for a good durable 10-year 
automotive requirement. And that is, it gives us a lot of flexibility. And in this case, we selected anode-free uh, manganese uh, as a cathode material. Um, we're developing our own uh, chemistry uh, for a range extender cell. But I'm gonna show you now a chart where I think it's, um, this is a bit of me just speculating and predicting the future based on the past. If you look at the nature of these cloud diagrams where, oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't label my axes. Uh, that's a terrible thing. Uh, on the bottom is uh, uh, gravimetric or uh, watt hours per kilogram uh, chemistry for a cell or cell level energy density. And on the Y axis is the volumetric density in watt hours per liter. If you look at that very common way of viewing chemistry clouds and where chemistries perform, we are currently in the phase of development in the you know, 2010s to the 2020s, where intercalation and single electron per ion are the chemistries that we are all working with right now. And you know, one has a R&D effort, uh, Gen 1 and Gen 2, that are based, basically working on intercalation model and anode free is the higher end version of that. But there's also another generation of chemistries coming. And I see that emergence happening right now, which is that you get multiple electrons that will emerge with a much higher energy density, but they're going to have a much lower voltage at end of discharge. And so the second thing that we're seeing as an architectural topic is that if you, you fast forward 10 years, we're going to be in a position where it, it advances from, you know, maybe great institutions like Stanford and others in the world will come up with an energy density that we all want, but it's going to be complicated to use. Conversion chemistries are notoriously slow in C-rate. They have very difficult times with operating conditions and maybe temperature. They also have very difficult times with wide voltage. And that bottom right chart of voltage curves kind of shows that a conversion chemistry, the blue multi-stepped chemistry line, um, you can start out at 400 volts at a battery level, a pack level and end up at 150 volts at the bottom of discharge. Most motors and inverters don't like that. So our idea is to decouple the range extender behind DC to DC converters that then can use energy at whatever voltage and C rate that is necessary. And then you can slowly transfer that to the traction battery, the blue battery. And that battery being smaller, 150 miles a day, is there and ready to be charged by its power supply on board. And it runs the motor inverter directly. And in that architecture, while we're working on anode free, we're also quite agnostic. We, we, we actually are working in collaboration with several companies that are on the right-hand chart here, developing various energy density options at low cycle life. And so we have a supplier C and a supplier B working on you know, more than 800 watt hours per liter, 400 watt hours per kilogram kind of chemistries where the cycle life is not good enough to make it into automotive but we can actually develop the candidate for a range extender application while we're working with a common LFP traction battery um, as we go forward. So if I now plot, what does that look like at a system level? Um, whether you pick a sedan, an SUV or a pickup truck, the battery pack size is a little different. You get sizes like a Tesla Model 3 has a 330 watt hour per liter pack, or sorry, 330 liter pack. Um, the uh, condition of a, of a pickup truck could even have a 500 to 600 liter pack volume. And why that's important is that remember, we're trying to deliver power, daily driving and daily range with the blue battery. The percentage of volume allocated to the traction battery takes away from how much range extender I can put on board. And so in that map, you have this sort of design envelope where Gemini can, depending on whether I want 150 miles a day or, or 100 miles per day, um, that's the boundary of the two curves there. That design space is an OEM decision. So as we've received now OEM uh, interactions and we're working with uh, car companies to design Gemini for their platforms, some are smaller, some are bigger. 
the solutions vary. But if you look at the left, we're in the 400 to 500 watt hours per liter capability with cells that are on test today and batteries that are going in sedans, SUVs, and trucks. And that is about double where the market is right now. And if you look at you know, how quickly can you scale up, for example, an anode free cell, we are building 170 amp hour anode free cells right now. After only a year's worth of development, we've been able to resolve electrolyte, cell compression, and gassing, and lots of topics. And 200 cycles is the reason that we're successfully moving so fast is that we don't need the cycle life to be full automotive and we don't need the C rates to be full C rates. So comparing ourselves as a benchmark between Aries and Gemini to three commonly referred to battery packs in the industry, we have the BMW i3 as an NCM pack using 622 chemistry. Uh, we have a Tesla Model 3 using NCA cylindrical cells. We have the LFP version of the Model 3, which is um, you know, a very good uh, ad advancement, I believe, and show, shows strength in our assumption that LFP is going to pick up massive traction and displace NCM and NCA at a baseline level. We see these three batteries in volumetric density at 151, 232, and 173 watt hours per liter, both of the batteries that we're producing uh, and prototyping uh, at one have energy densities that are higher than that. Uh, 287 to 474, we're actually moving forward with the agenda of trying to double the uh, range of an electric vehicle, but also get rid of nickel cobalt as a, uh, a heavily relied upon material. Uh, so with that, I will turn the uh, talk back over to our moderator and uh, appreciate you uh, taking the time to join and listen. And I'm uh, happy to take questions as the moderator, as William uh, would direct. All right, Mujib, thank you so much for that uh, quite in-depth overview of your technology. I always appreciate startups sharing um, this level of detail. Uh, so we have a number of questions. Um, so uh, let me get started there. So one question, Mujib, is on the use case of your range extender concept. So, you know, with these more advanced energy dense systems, um, the calorie life at high state of charge is also an issue as well. So the question is, the way the range extender is operated, um, is it, it will be charged before use, and then most of the time, it would just be in the in the low state of charge states to maintain life uh, during storage. Yeah, we we think that the state of charge ideal for the range extenders around seventy five percent. It won't be kept at a low state of charge, but it is unlikely that we want to keep it at the highest state of charge. And where where you could think about that is, let's say that we set a target where the vehicle has a range capability of seven hundred miles EPA, and we take twenty five percent out of that. Uh, range extender that might take 100 or 150 miles away from the range extender still a very very solid amount of range is always available and that you could have the ability to boost charge when you're really going on the longest of trips mm -hmm. just like the model 3 and the model s and the model y ask you a question do you want to keep your battery at the top state of charge or do you want to back off a little bit the same thing can be true for the way our user interface will work. However, I think it's important to recognize the comment that was made on calendar life as being essential. We must have high capability to manage, even at high temperature storage, that the cell doesn't have a gassing problem, doesn't have a cycle life problem based on calendar life fade. And right now, lithium ion is producing around a 2% per year uh, kind of degradation in very high temperature and much less than 1% in normal markets. So the average for lithium ion battery is you're losing about 1% a year for especially lithium iron phosphate as a pretty stable uh, calendar life. We, we are going to target the same thing uh, as we're validating our chemistries, but 200 cycles of cycling capability is a relief, but calendar life, we do need to maintain a very long and strong capability there. 
Which if I absolutely agree, I always feel that calendar life is one thing academics don't talk about. And that's the one thing yeah. that actually matters the most. Um, yeah. The, a second question uh, comes back to the specification you were showing. So you showed um, the greatly improved energy density volumetrically and graphometrically. So the question has to do with the absolute weight of the battery as a whole. Uh, because when you operate without the range extender, you're still carrying the range extender as well. Yeah. Is there any impact on the system weight as a whole? Yeah, right now, uh, batteries today, like a, a, a Tesla Model uh, 3 battery today has around 165 watt hours per kilogram. Our target is 300, uh, 300 watt hours per kilogram. So it's it's trying to maintain the weight so that we're not adding a lot of weight, but we're trying to double the amount of energy. It's trying to. But I do think we're going to have some penalty. I think that there's, it's likely that you're going to see 50 to 100 kilograms extra weight to get to this goal. What I also see is that the most common market resonant point that we've had so far is the truck, the pickup truck. Because the pickup truck has payload capability, it doesn't have a lot of space to add range. And the range need is much greater than what's currently installed. Um, we think that the alignment of our targets is sufficient mm -hmm. to design a proper battery. We think a pickup truck needs around a 300 kilowatt hour battery. And the average right now is around 130, 140. So, you know, putting a 300 kilowatt hour battery in a pickup truck means you can go back to closing the gap and you could tow with it. You can uh, hill climb with it. You can go on long trips and you don't have to worry about all of the inefficiencies of drag coefficient frontal area and weight uh, penalizing you so much that you can't achieve the range goals that you have. Very exciting, Majib. Last question before we have our panel discussion. So in your forecasting of the market, and you know, there's multiple segment, what do you think might be the range of ratio between your traction battery and your range extender battery? Uh, I imagine that it really depends on the application, how you split it. Yeah, we, we think it uh, in terms of physical space, it's one third traction, two thirds range extender. In terms of range, we think it's 150 miles for the traction and a rough target of 600 miles for the range extender, EPA. I always talk EPA because it's so hard to go back and forth and it gets confusing. So, you know, and by the way, that's the other like really important thing to realize is I'm not an advocate for 700 or 750 miles of real world range, I'm an advocate for 750 miles of EPA range so that you can get the 400 miles that everyone actually commonly needs to take a six hour or seven hour trip regionally. And, and that's where our targets have come from. Mm -hmm. Mujib, I think it's a, a very disruptive idea. So I think it's just like in Chao Yan's talk, people have to get comfortable with this idea. Uh, that um, you know, only a third of your battery is the traction battery. So I think it's a yeah. very, very exciting idea. So I see that uh, Chao Yang uh, has rejoined us and E as well. Uh, so it is a tradition in this seminar to have an open-ended discussion at the end. Um, so maybe let me just get started and, um, and get the blood flowing here. I think what I'm learning from both of you is that you have identified a way in which the system complexity is a little bit higher, but there is tremendous gain at the performance or behavior of the system at the systems level. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, you know, how do you find this optimal complexity? If you go too complex, there are a lot of other problem that shows up as well. And, um, you know, have you reached that optimal complexity? And what are some of the price you have to pay uh, as a result of this higher complexity um, that um, you will have to to mitigate for. Maybe I can ask uh, Chaoyang to 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 take this one first. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's interesting. So uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, what I really want to do is to simplify the system, right? So I do everything possible, try to get rid of thermal management, no cooling, no liquid, and uh, and so on. And, and we will also try to uh, develop new materials that are thermally highly stable. So they are heat resistant and they would have enhanced safety 
without even the safety devices on the pack level. And because on, as a system level, whatever you do, it's, it doesn't contribute to your energy and add the cost, volume, and uh, weight. Okay, it's all management or system level is not good. <laughs> right, management is all cost money. <laughs> uh, so I think I think uh, uh, I believe <clears throat> one of the direction in the future really is to simplify the system at the pack level and try to make cells intrinsically safe, intrinsically capable, and also uh, intrinsically robust. In other words, you know whether you put a nail penetration or you kick it or you you step on it, it just doesn't blow up. And on the outside of the cell. You don't have much. You even don't have, you know, liquid cooling. You can use aspirated, uh, you know, air convection uh, while you drive the vehicle. Because when you drive a vehicle, you get this air convection for free, right? And if you don't drive, you don't need thermal management. So I think there's ways. There are many ways to try to simplify the system, and we are moving towards that. Yeah, I, I want to echo these comments. I think there's some insightful uh, points that, that uh, Chao Wang has raised. The, <clears throat> the higher the level of energy in a battery um, going up to two to 300 kilowatt hours, the lower the average C rates and stress, the lower the thermal management needs, the more you can simplify a subsystem. The more energy you put on board, the lower the less frequently you are going to hit uh, discharge, uh, depths of discharge levels, that's going to simplify and improve life. It's also very true that if you put six or 700 miles on board, you're not gonna need to fast charge that battery very often because you're not urgently needing energy. You're gonna charge overnight. And if you can give a battery a C over eight charge every time, that's great. Um, so I think part of the idea where we might have added some complexity in power electronics. And I, I, I thought a lot about that, by the way, because like the most frequent thing in a battery that fails is the electronics and our, our reliability, confidence, interval planning. The, the electronics are actually a big factor. But inverters for an electric vehicle are also electronics, and we're expecting them to meet 10-year life. And DC to DC converters for low voltage systems are in electric vehicles, we expect them to meet 10 year life. Chargers are power electronics. We expect them to meet 10 or more year life. So there's no difference in all of those that I've mentioned and us putting power electronics in the battery to convert energy. If we can simplify other things, it actually is plausible that the electronics don't add a significant burden and we take away burdens like thermal management, fast charge capability, very high currents needed in fast charge are usually what are driving electrical distribution, contactor sizing, fuses si sizing. Mm -hmm. Electric vehicles power profile is actually fairly straightforward. It's pulses of power with relatively low average numbers. It's the fast charging that's caused batteries to adopt strategies that are kind of significantly harder. And if we can eliminate that pain by just putting enough energy on board, that can help uh, quite a bit. The last thing that I will compliment on uh, Chao Wang's uh, statement is let's get a safe, safer chemistry. The more robust and safe the chemistries are, the less you have to worry about the complexity of safety systems and, mm -hmm. and other like mitigating factors in thermal runaway. And so I kind of feel like we adopted some complexity, but we might have enhanced other and reduced complexity in other ways. Thanks, Mujib. So I, I, I really resonate with that. It's the optimization of the total complexity. And indeed, you're adding some complexity in the DC, um, the DC electronics. But am I correct, Mujib, to also assume that the cost impact, again, is absorbed somewhere else by decreasing complexity elsewhere? Yeah, the cost impact for our range extender, we decided it, that's one of the reasons we decided to get rid of the graphite. Going after uh, reduction in raw materials on cell resulted in a way to pay for the DC to DC converters. Mm -hmm. And nickel cobalt, 22 bucks a kilogram before the price spikes have happened recently, we're looking at $1 per kilogram for our cathode chemistry. So we're going from 22 bucks a kilogram to one, from $8 per kilogram to zero. 
our goal is to make a disruptively low cost range extender cell that has not great cycle life, but very, very high energy density that will pay for the DC to DC converter and other power electronics more than pay for it. I think that, you know, what the both of you have said is basically developing an engineering solution to break um, the constraint of conventional trade-offs, right? So you don't That's have right. to pay the conventional price. Very, very exciting. E, would you like to take the next uh, Yeah, question? sure. Thank you, Will. Uh, Majib, a really, really nice uh, idea. Uh, from your idea and Chaoyang, both of your idea, I think it's kind of looking this at the problem. It's different approach. Uh, maybe I'll just try to be <laughs> slightly uh, pro provocative right here. Chaoyang, you're emphasizing, hey, let's go to smaller pack, right? I can do enable three R, reduce, right? <laughs> uh, reuse and recycling. And Maju, you're going to the other one, you say, hey, I want to have my range right there. <laughs> so well, why listening to both sides and say, wow, you know, all great ideas right here. Um, and um, can you guys uh, make a comment a little bit about, I mean, your approach and the other person's approach, right? I'm also thinking is uh, whether there's a uh, synergy of both of your approach that can come out of today's discussion, yeah. Well, it's a little bit provocative, but uh, I think there could be synergy to be built. Uh, I don't know who wants to take this question first. <laughs> Not necessarily well, an I, easy one. <laughs> I, I would like to compliment that I think we're on the same page for making the traction battery smaller and more capable. And with LFP, there's a lot of synergy in what we've said around the idea that the traction battery, the main purpose of an electric vehicle is the 150 miles a day. What I'm augmenting in Chao Wang's proposal is that let's add a range extender on board. And effectively that also can be a consumer decision. Remember an electric vehicle will be sold in the market where consumers right now might be getting one number and they choose to either buy an electric car or don't buy an electric car based on that one number. What we're offering is, okay, maybe the OEMs can offer small, medium, and large range extender, and they could offer 500 miles, 600 miles, or 700 miles. And then you start to mitigate the cost factor. You give the consumer choices. I was taught when my career at Ford by a marketing guy that if you want someone to choose your product, don't give them one choice because then it's either in or out. Give them three choices, and then they'll start thinking about which one of the three they like. And actually, I really believe that. And I think range <laughs> being such an important idea in electric vehicle uh, factor and uh, decision, if the consumer, like my, I'm a consumer that wants to go everywhere with my electric car and I want to tow with it, I'm going to choose the highest range every single time. Other people that live in metro areas that don't travel a lot will be different. But what the range extender does is it kind of leverages, let's put the burden on the traction battery to be really robust make it smaller. So in a way we're in agreement on that, make it powerful and capable, and then give options, optionality on range by putting a range extender on board. And so uh, Professor uh, Chow Wing, uh, please. Uh, so maybe before just how you start, how you can I inject something here? Since Majin mentioned this, uh, I'm thinking, well, what's the engineering challenging or uh, practical challenging right there. The range extender can be added on any time. Would that be possible? Let's say you, you buy the 150 miles car, you know, car, then you say, well, you know, next couple of weeks, I need this range extender for uh, two weeks. Uh, I just go in and then check it out and install it. And maybe that's hard. Maybe that's hard from both engineering and practical standpoint. Is that a viable idea, Majid? Yeah, I mean, I think it is a viable idea. I think from my perspective, the range extender having, I mean, the, our goal is to make the range extender a bit about the OEM helping us decide the right way to implement. Because now we have three independent variables that they used to be dependent. The three independent variables is, are how much daily range do you want and how much power do you want? And then how much range do you want? And we can size according to those needs. And what I found in discussions with OEMs is that they want the flexibility of independently optimizing those 
because some platforms want a lot more power than others. Some want a lot more range than others. And we're giving the ability to kind of optimize that to the OEM in the sizing exercise of how the battery is put together. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, our approach is uh, strikingly similar at the fundamental level, right? Well, Jeep has a onboard range extender and I have an offboard range extender, which is my fast <laughs> charger, right? So they, they all try to extend range. And of course, yes. you know, I like to not pay for the range extender and not be able to carry that range extender and by, by consuming the energy. But you know, whenever I need, I hope I have 10 minute convenience to get the energy. So I think that's a difference. I also, you know, and, and, and of course, <clears throat> traction battery, you consume less raw materials and you know you you, you make the world a better place so i hope you know when the mujib's company succeed and someday he will be waiting actually to dismantle his own range extender and put it on the roadside and be able to share with his neighbors a few <laughs> neighbors because you, you have like a, well 100 150 kilowatt hour second pack that's like a fast charger that's like a charger you put it on the roadside share with two or three neighbors and that's i think a pretty good thing to do it's it's good <laughs> yeah for, for cost i, I like that i like the concept we could environment we can add another plug for people to plug into the uh, range extender car and get a charge from it. <laughs> exactly and assume you know your your concept is going to be commercialized and will be adopted by let's say what a 20 million <clears throat> new cars to be sold you know in the united states and all of a sudden we have 20 million new chargers and then a year later we have 40 million new chargers and i think that very soon, you know, we will have sufficient uh, uh, charging infrastructure. I, I want to make a comment, though, on fast charging, and I've had some personal experiences, if I may. Um, and, and I do believe I have a slightly different opinion about fast charging today. Um, I, I, I have a, a Model Y, and I use fast charging quite often for the purpose of moving through trips that are more than the range of the vehicle. Um, but what I found is that if I take real world into account, let's start with 306 miles is the predicted range of my Model Y. When I drive highway speeds, it quickly goes to 200 miles. At that 200 mile point, if I fast charge, the first 200 miles, okay, maybe I drive 180 miles because I didn't want to go all the way to zero. So I drove 180 miles. Now, when I fast charge back up, I only go up to 70% because it's not going to fast charge beyond that because it tapers off. So I, I've actually returned about a hundred miles back to my vehicle. So I was at 20, 20 miles and now I go up another hundred miles. So 120 miles is the real world number. Now I drive, I have to drive every hundred miles I'm stopping. And by the way, I've done that. I've done that in more trips than you know, and in including towing where I had to stop, take the vehicle off my Model Y, leave it in a parking lot, go ahead and charge and come back and pick up my, my tow vehicle because there wasn't enough range. So fast charging is I promise, and people think, okay, I got a 300 mile range. I'm gonna get another 300 miles by fast charging. That isn't the case. Because first of all, deduct for real world. Second of all, give yourself 70%. And when you find that every hundred miles you're stopping, it's way too often, and I've done it before. I've gone on very long trips and found that that detracts from the experience of electric vehicles. So even with fast charging and fast, fast charging, and notwithstanding, maybe you have to stand in a line, maybe there's not enough power at the 20 stations to handle everyone getting the same charge rate. I've had those problems in Silicon Valley going to Lake Tahoe. You, you can have the problem that the fast chargers only give you you know, the total station power divided by 20, and then you're stuck with like slow charging, not fast charging. But in, in irrespective of all those noise factors, there is the factor of not getting to 100% again, and then hopscotching every 100 miles. And that's why I'm not fully reliant in my idea around fast charging behavior. It, this is very nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, Will, back to you. No, this is great. I, I think now the blood is flowing. This is great. Um, let me add to ease uh, provocativeness um, and, and maybe poke a little bit, if I may. 
Um, so, so the both of you, uh, Charya and Mujib, I think paint a very promising picture, but there's still problems to be solved and hypotheses to be tested. In your mind, what is not completely known at this time for your technology that you're trying to demonstrate or de-risk? Uh, maybe what are some of the concerns people are raising uh, in terms of, you know, it, it, I think it's clear that if this works, it will have great impact. Uh, but what are that, you know, final, you know, couple of tens of percent that you still have to demonstrate in order to really make this extremely or fully compelling? Um, I know this is a bit provocative, so uh, I apologize if it's too, too, too much to the heart of, part of the problem. Uh, maybe I can ask Chaoyang to, to take a shot at this. Yeah. Okay. Before I answer your question, uh, you know, I think uh, what Mojib uh, said uh, is very sensitive, uh, sensible. Uh, in the real world, you do have to account for various losses and so on. And uh, now, of course, we require fast charging to reach eighty percent SOC, right? So this is all. Uh, you know, we have to maintain this, uh, uh, our high standard, uh, but. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, when I do research, I always uh, feel like this this simple truth, and that is storage. Storage, like as a number I gave you, storage is one thousand times more expensive than refilling. So I'm trying to find every single way, way to You're right. refill the energy rather than try to store and present. Now, having yes. said that, coming back to um, Will's question. Uh, I think there's numerous challenges uh, ahead of us, even I think in, in uh, 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 toward, uh, uh, you know, to this day, uh, our fast charging technology is pretty mature, reliable in the laboratory, has been verified by third party and in, in, you know, also has been ma made in packs uh, 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 in small quantity and so on. But in order to adopt it in the uh, uh, automotive industry, it still takes time. Commercialization takes a long time. And first of all, you have four or five years this, uh, before the, you know, between this uh, design freeze and then eventually uh, getting into the marketplace. And then you also have uh, numerous other things to handle. So, uh, uh, but I think in principle, there should be no scientific issues. And uh, uh, in my case, I think it's all boils down to engineering implementation. And uh, we are hoping that there will be more uh, people and more companies and, and capable engineers will come in and start to make this technology as slick as possible and get even lower cost. And eventually will allow us to, to enjoy a better word, like I said, you know, fast charging really enable you to uh, make batteries and you know, <coughs> affordable and uh, sustainable. And the, that is uh, the kind of idea that excites me and, and, and motivates me uh, in the research. Acharya, if I could, I will use your um, uh, statement here to recruit my new students. Make the battery technology more slick. <laughs> I think that will resonate <laughs> with many people, and maybe also recruiting uh, employees as well. Um, yeah. China, if, if I can maybe just propose a question from my end, uh, something that I thought of during your presentation, that I think you demonstrate beautifully that the average um, degradation is not a problem uh, as you go up to temperature. The time spent is minimal. Um, your fundamental study, um, I, I've read actually, uh, I think was a shout, uh, uh, the, uh, your paper you wrote in 2017 in Journal Power Sources, just beautifully shows all the advantages of going to higher temperature. The one question I have is, to me, one of the unknown is if the failure probability, uh, the statistical failure probability increases with temperature. So I'm a big fan of using Weibull distribution is it possible that when you go up in temperature, your more rare events also increase, and then that increases the defects per, per, parts per million um, at, at, the, at the cell level, maybe for failure or unexpected non-average behavior of the cell with temperature? Do you think that could be a problem? Uh, uh, fundamentally, I don't think so. I think it's going to the opposite because uh, 
you know, when you when you design your electrochemical reactions around the room temperature, we all know, you know, we are very sensitive to the temperature variation. You know, in the industry, people say, well, you know, the cell to cell temperature difference should not be more than five degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. right? And uh, Percentage wise, that's pretty big. Now, if I go to 60 degrees Celsius, and for the same percentage, I can probably afford, you know, 10 degrees Celsius. If I go further to solid state batteries, where you have, you are basically very tolerant to, 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 to temperature, you can go even higher. And let me give you an analogy. Maybe it's not a, a huge, hugely appropriate, but, you know, if you do combustion at 1000 degrees Celsius, you really don't care what impurity you have in there. You can burn anything. Right, and whereas you try to do some reaction at room temperature, you need a catalyst, you need all this precious metal as in the fuel cell case. So I believe eventually as we go towards uh, heat resistant batteries and operating batteries at an elevated temperature, we will get a lot of easier uh, 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 environment to operate. And internal combustion engine is another example. I mean, if you, consider that such a small amount of heat produced from battery. I mean, battery round trip efficiency is 90%. It's, it's only 10%. Let's say waste the heat product. If you take that small amount of heat and put it into the internal combustion engine uh, heat dissipation environment with a huge temperature difference, you don't need any cooling. You probably have to find a way how to keep the cells warm or temperature retaining. Uh, so I think it's a very different ball game. Right? There's a lot of uh, 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 scientific uh, open questions or possibilities waiting for us to explore. Chai, I think you're, you're. I think this is a very um, big shift in the mindset. So I think you're saying that with increasing temperature, not only the mean will move in the right direction, but the tail will also move in the right direction. So maybe perhaps increasing the reliability of the system for a large number. So I think that's a that's a really large shift in mindset. I think that's very exciting to think about. Yeah, thank you. So Muji, same question. Um, what are the unknowns you're trying to answer? What are the hypotheses you're trying to test and de-risk for your technology? Muji, I think you're muted. Sorry. Uh, on the Celta pack, uh, we are de-risked and I believe we're okay on the Aries launch. On the uh, Gemini battery, it's really two still uh, research related topics that I believe are difficult. The first is that we're making a cell at a very, very high energy density. Our current cell performance is just shy of a thousand watt hours per liter. And it still uses a flammable electrolyte. It still has lithium metal. It is a bit of a, you know, I'd say it's a lot to manage. And we're trying to figure out the right sort of number of amp hours, how to manage gassing, safety, thermal runaway, and not let that become a problem for the pack level. Even though the cathode is safer, we still have electrolyte, we still have lithium metal, we still have a lot of energy in one spot. And so we have to work our way through that. And we haven't solved all of that yet. The second uh, is, is calendar life. It's really high temperature stability, avoiding uh, degradation, fade, and gassing. In the composition of a lithium metal anode, you can get like a lot of reactions are happening, side reactions are happening in the cell. So we haven't fully de-risked that. Power electronics and uh, pack architecture and coming up with, you know, like system design, we've actually de-risked all of that. The engineering is going along and according to plan, we're executing that. It's really around the chemistry. And what, what we're thinking about here also is, we are um, about to launch a campaign to open up the field of companies that we wanna work with on the range extender chemistry that effectively, if you're out there and you have a 200 cycle life chemistry with good performance on energy density and safety, come see us because we can give you a path to automotive market because actually we're agnostic. We don't need to finish this um, by ourselves. We are willing to partner on the cell chemistry, but those two areas are still I would say I'm, I'm a bit concerned with, um, especially the energy in one spot, the cell is still got lithium metal and it's still got elect liquid electrolyte. Uh, we have to work hard on that topic. Mujib, it's so refreshing to hear you um, as a CEO of a startup to talk about the weaknesses as well. 
I, I think it's uh, not everybody's willing to say that. So really appreciate it. Yeah, I think I, we're at the end of the hour. Uh, could you do you want to close us out by asking um, the finale questions? No, maybe not asking questions, just uh, uh, probably just share some of my, well, I, I would say uh, very exciting uh, for both of your talk, uh, share my excitement right here. Uh, so Majib, uh, consider silicon end for your case, because you're looking for 200 cycles, silicon has some really high energy density cell right there, 400, 450 watt, watt per, per kilogram, more than a thousand watt per liter. And Chao Yang, you know, you're thinking of doing uh, actually engineering and so one layer can have system level impact. That's just super exciting. Both of you, I uh, give my high uh, compliment to uh, both of you. I and mean, that's a real for my side, you should uh, conclude today's event. <laughs> Thank you, that's awesome. I, I think, you know, great system engineering is the best friend of great chemistry breakthroughs. So we have a number of chemistry people here, a number of systems people all melted into one. So I think this has been a very, accelerating discussion. Um, Chaoyang and Muji, thank you for making the time. We, we really appreciate it. Um, so uh, if I can have the closeout slides, please, Evan. So um, following today's excellent talk, we will have another industry academic pair uh, two weeks from now, uh, featuring the CTO of Blue Current, who is developing a polymer-based solid-state battery with silicon anodes. And then we'll also have um, our colleague, uh, Professor Alberto Saleo, talk about polymers, uh, soft materials for uh, energy storage. Uh, we're really delighted to have all these excellent academic industry pairing. This is one of the pillars of our initiative here. Um, and please stay connected with us. Um, we have a bunch of exciting announcements coming, exciting events. We just hosted our first in-person event with Professor Martin Winter uh, from the University of Munster earlier this week. So please uh, uh, connect with us via LinkedIn uh, and social media. And, um, and for those of you interested in learning more about battery technologies and other uh, technology for the energy transition, we have a number of courses uh, that you can take uh, from our professional education program. And with that, let me thank uh, Chaoyang, Mujib, and Yi one more time for a great, lively discussion today. And I hope everyone a great um, weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Chaoyang. Thank, Thank you, Mochi. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Thank you. Good being with you. Take care. Thank you.